Palestine Forum. It doesn't have a specific topic, uh, but it tackles the Palestinian cause from different dimensions. I would like to introduce the uh, forum. Uh, the Arab Center for Research and Policy Studies and the Institute uh, announced uh, the organization of this uh, forum in 2022. It is an academic space where Palestinian researchers and non-Palestinian researchers from all over the world present their research paper as to the Palestinian cause and the socio-economic uh, situation in light of the apartheid and the colonial regime and Zionism Zionism and the uh, freedom movements and Palestine and the relations with the Arab world and the international uh, countries. 60 papers uh, are going to be presented out of uh, more than 300 uh, applications. There will be specialized uh, sessions in addition to six uh, workshops. All of these papers were peer-reviewed, and uh, they have been distributed per topic. In addition to that, this forum allows the participants to partake in the forum, especially if they have any interest uh, in the Palestinian cause, where people, interested people can meet and exchange uh, points of view. We are sure that this is going to boost the academic research uh, when it comes to Palestine, but also to highlight the importance of the Palestinian cause at the international and Arab levels. Given the large number of research papers, the sessions are going to be held in the future, where uh, in, the, in the morning, whereas in the afternoon, the workshops are going to be held. We have parallel tracks. We have parallel sessions. On the first day, we have three tracks in Salwa 1, Salwa 2, Salwa 3. And the general workshops are going to be held here in the majlis in the evening of every day. Sunday, which is the second day, a fourth track is going to be open. and it will be in Dukhan room. I would also like to draw your attention uh, to the fact that the second uh, workshop tomorrow is going to be exceptionally held uh, at the Arab Center headquarters. And the first workshop is going to start uh, at 3. And uh, there will be a celebration of the uh, Palestinian uh, memory at the, uh, in the evening. This is just an overview regarding this forum. It is part of the annual agenda of the two institutions. The Institute for Palestine Studies uh, has been dedicated since uh, 60 years to the study of uh, the Palestinian cause. But I would like also to highlight the contribution of the Arab Center for Research and Policy Studies in this cause. The Arab world is the academic space of this uh, center, and uh, the Palestinian cause is key and central and has repercussions regionally and internationally. This is why the Arab Center endeavors to promote academic papers and foster academic discussions by dedicating seven academic conferences uh, uh, on the Palestinian cause in addition to lectures and workshops. And the uh, center uh, publishes several studies, uh, uh, approximately one 120 studies, 50 books, including case studies highlighting the latest political developments relating to the Palestinian cause locally, regionally, and internationally. The Arab Index, published every two years by the Arab Center, dedicates the special uh, section to the Palestinian cause every year. and. Uh, the project started in 2019, and the forum is going to witness tomorrow the launching of the website. It highlights the archives 
containing the, uh, the thousands of uh, documents about the Palestinian movement, Palestinian cause, and this is in co collaboration with the Institute for Palestine Studies. I will not take long before giving uh, the uh, floor to Dr. Tarek Mitri. I would like uh, to introduce uh, Dr. Tarek Mitri, although uh, he is well known. Dr. Tarek Mitri is uh, the uh, president of uh, St. Uh, George uh, University in Beirut. Uh, he worked in Beirut uh, between 2014 and 2000. Uh, 19. He was the special representative of the Secretary General of the United Nations and, uh, in Libya, and he held several ministerial positions in Lebanon until 2011. Uh, he, visiting professor and professor at University of St. Joseph, Harvard, and AUB, in addition to several uh, regional and international organizations. He uh, also uh, played uh, an important role when it comes to uh, the uh, instit different institutions. He is a member of the strategic board of Université Saint-Joseph and the board of directors of the ACRPS. He has authored many books and articles on contemporary Arab issues, religion and politics, and interreligious and intercultural uh, dialogue. He is also the director of the Isam Ferris Institute for Public Policy and International Affairs and special representative of the UN Secretary General for Libya. And uh, he has several publications. Uh, on uh, religion, on uh, law and society, and uh, economics, and he has uh, several studies. Uh, Dr. Tariq Mitri, the floor is yours. Sabah <laughs> khair. Good morning. On behalf of the Arab Center for Research and Policy Studies and the Institute for Palestine Studies, it is a great pleasure to welcome you all this morning, dear friends, colleagues, and participants. I would like to thank you for your presence here with us, and I would like to thank the organizers of this forum. It is also a great pleasure to begin by highlighting the partnership between the uh, Institute for Palestine Studies and the Arab Center for Research and Policy Studies. I think that this is a natural relationship that is uh, being consolidated every day. It is based on strong pillars to include three pillars. The two academic research institutes focus on the Palestinian cause and the Arab Zionist conflict from different uh, perspectives and different uh, aspects. We are talking about also two Arab institutions, which means their interest in the Palestinian cause is linked with their Arab belonging. The two institutions are keen to look into the causes that interest the Arab world, particularly Palestine, from an angle that highlights the Arab identity and the fact that uh, the conflict with Israel is not exclusively Palestinian, but it is an Arab Zionist conflict. These two institutions are also independent, intellectually independent. They carry out their scientific research 
independently of uh, parties and uh, they have no partisan affiliations. This explains the presence uh, of a uh, variety of uh, researchers from different backgrounds and we will listen to their presentations underlining the different aspects of the causes of the cause and the conflict there are some aspects that uh, we know a lot about and some other aspects that remain understudied some aspects were studied, some other aspects need further studies. The experience of the Institute and the Center and the field of spreading awareness when it comes to the Palestinian cause proved that despite the current priorities that we have to deal with today, the study of the past and uh, the preservation of the collective memory and the preservation of national identity are very important and they also open the doors for our understanding of the past and better understanding the present. They also drive us to study the current affairs in order to look towards the future, taking into account the aspirations and ambitions and having realistic uh, consideration of what is possible and what is not possible. All the thinking that we are going to do together during this forum about future prospects is not uh, limited uh, to the political solution, the two-state solution. Many people publicly and secretly talked about uh, the decline of this system and also the increasing uh, effect of the apartheid uh, regime. and the calls for justice within one state and equality within one state. However, Israel is still applying double standards. Israel continues its uh, colonial, colonialism and settlement, and Israel still implements apartheid regime against the Palestinian people using different means and different uh, degrees between the Palestinians of 1948 and uh, the occupied territories of 1967. It is clear that the ruling majority in Israel rejects all possible solutions, even at the minimum level, and uh, they focus on the uh, continuation of the apartheid regime and investing the Arab disagreements and disputes between the states and the confrontations between the people and the regimes and a number of countries. This situation has been ongoing for a long time and it is not probable in the near future to see Israel accepting any solution which invites the Palestinians to avoid going in the direction of unfair settlements and this invites the Palestinians at the same time to adopt the path of confrontation and resistance at different uh, levels that bring together the Palestinian people instead of dividing them and uh, in order to bring the Palestinians together with Arab people aspiring for freedom and their friends and the world. The resistance against uh, occupation, apartheid, normalization, 
and doing away with the rightful rights of the Palestinian people does not offer uh, solutions uh, in and of itself, but this opens uh, new pathways for the continuation of the struggle and trying to take into account the local considerations in line with the regional and international situation. This also opens another door, which is the rebuilding of the national unity of the Palestinian people and the strength of the position of the Palestinian people. In addition to that, the Arab Center for Research and Policy Studies and the Institute for Palestine Studies underline the Arab aspect of the Palestinian cause. We are talking about two Arab institutions that uh, bring together the rights of the Palestinian people and the freedoms of the Arab people. The freedom for the Arab people and the respect of the rights of the Palestinian people. Some people since uh, the Arab Spring thought that uh, bringing these two aspects together is impossible because these revolutions pushed people to give particular attention to their local domestic affairs at the expense of the Palestinian cause. And the animosity towards Israel, according to some, this is what they thought, is no longer the priority. And it seemed also impossible for some of the Palestinian people. Some of them adopted an Arab policy based on choosing regimes or some regimes despite the fact that uh, there were oppressive regimes in the name of resistance etc however the popular voices against Israel and considering that Israel is a threat to the Arab people all over the Arab world did not change a lot despite everything that was said and for instance, we can see the results of the poll of the Arab index year after year. This poll result shows that the majority of the Arab people consider Israel a threat to them because they are Arabs. And the strong feelings uh, sympathizing with uh, the Palestinian cause increased in the Arab world publicly after being implicit and what we saw here in Doha is a clear example what we saw during the FIFA World Cup 2022 during this tournament the Arab sentiment in support of the Palestinian people was clearly highlighted. This Arab sentiment, and of course uh, here we can talk about uh, the proof that we have, this went in parallel with uh, the fact that some Arab regimes normalized the relations with Israel at the expense of the Palestinian cause. This solidarity in the Arab world went hand in hand with solidarity expressed all over the world with the Palestinian people and the cause to boycott Israel and to impose sanctions on Israel were uh, spread all over the world because of these apartheid policies and because of the occupation. Thirdly, the institute and the center are keen to preserve their intellectual independence which requires setting a distance between them and 
the partisan discussions and disputes and ideological and political divisions and not being linked with any entity in a way that would restrict the work of the researchers and the freedom of the researchers. The two institutions refuse to uh, serve as propaganda machine for a certain political position. This does not weaken our general political position and commitment and does not undermine our support of the rights of the Palestinian people, the fight against Zionism and the defense of the Palestinian cause as a universal moral and ethical cause. This independence allows the Institute for Palestine Studies and the Arab Center for Research and Policy Studies to broaden the space for dialogue between academics, between researchers and interested participants from Palestine, the Arab world, and the world at large. Our hope is to see rich discussions based on your academic efforts and God willing we are going to yield some fruits at the end of this forum. Good luck. Thank you, Dr. Tariq, uh, for uh, this uh, speech. Before inviting Dr. Azmi Bishara uh, to uh, give the opening lecture, of course, we all know Dr. Azmi Bishara, but I will be giving you a brief overview of this bio. Dr. Azmi Bishara is the General Director of the Arab Center for Research and Policy Studies and the Chair of the Board of Trustees of the Doha Institute for Graduate Studies. He is a leading Arab researcher and intellectual with numerous books and publications on political thought, social theory, and philosophy. He was named by Le Nouveau Magazine Littéraire as one of the world's most influential thinkers. His publications in Arabic include Civil Society, A Critical Study, The Arabs in Israel, A Vision from Within, Antifada and Israeli Society, Prophecies about the Disabled Renaissance, From the Jewishness of the State to Sharon, 2004, On the Arab Question, An Introduction to an Arab Democratic Manifesto, 2007, To Be an Arab in Our Times, 2009, On Revolution, and uh, susceptibility to revolution 2012 religion and secularism in historical context in three volumes 2013 2015 the army and political power in the arab context theoretical problems 2017 the islamic state of iraq and the levant daesh a general framework and critical contribution to understanding the phenomenon 2018 what is populism 2019 and democratic transition and its problems, theoretical lessons from Arab experiences 2020. Some of these works have become key references within their respective fields. Bishara's English publications include Palestine Matters of Truth and Justice 2022, Hertz, On Salafism, Concepts and Contexts, Stanford University Press 2022, Sectarianism Without Sects, Oxford, University Press 2021, among other writings. His trilogy on the Arab revolutions, published uh, by I.B. Taurus, consists of Understanding Revolutions, Opening Acts in Tunisia, Egypt Revolution, Failed Transition, and Counter-Revolution, and Syria, in which he provides a theoretical analysis in addition to rich, comprehensive, and lucid assessment of the revolutions in three Arab countries, Tunisia, Egypt, and Syria. The first one is uh, about Tunisia, the second Egypt Revolution, Failed Transition and Counter-Revolution 2022, and Syria 2011-2013, Revolution and Tyranny Before the Mayhem 2023. Dr. Azmi, the floor is yours.
Assalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmah. Assalamu alaikum. Good morning, uh, dear guests, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to you all. This forum, the need for which was given considerable thought, embodies three main considerations. The first is the feasibility of holding it, given the sheer abundance of research on Palestine, on its past and present as a country, homeland, and as a society. Contributing to this cumulative corpus is no longer limited to Palestine, Palestinian research institute and universities and its production to Western universities and its publication through academic presses and specialized periodicals are no longer the exception. We are looking at a new phenomenon. And uh, uh, pessimists might argue that it is a sign that the Palestinian cause has been consigned to history. As such, research with a bias towards the indigenous people does not worry Western academic institutions. Rather, they feel it enriches their diversity, especially in the context of their academic subcultures, such as post-colonialism, critique of colonialism and gender studies, yet without projecting significant political orientations with regard to the foreign policy positions of their governments. It might also testify to a qualitative change owing to the ongoing liberalization of Western academia under threat from the populist right, as well as to a quantitative change thanks to the notable increase in the number of Palestinian academics specializing in the social sciences and humanities, keen to bring the tools and methods of academic research to bear on issues relevant to their people. These scholars have proliferated among universities and academic institutions across the world, including Middle Eastern studies departments, largely dominated by the official Israeli discourse when it comes to Palestine, Palestine and the history of the Arab-Israeli conflict. Other possible explanations for the prolific research come to mind. But as we contemplated the forum, it seemed that this phenomenon was important in and of itself and that the shift in academic discourse on Palestine in both the West and the East was of paramount significance. Even if it did not have direct political impacts, it would still affect political culture and public opinion via diverse intermediate links that filter into the consciousness of the Middle East affairs. Experts with which media outlets, educational institutions, and even decision makers supplement themselves to obtain expertise free of Zionist cliches about Palestine and the Arabs. It thus contributes to undermining the hegemony of Zionist discourse over a portion of analysts and experts in the West. Here, I would like to reiterate a point that have previously made about an academic discourse that combines scientific objectivity as methodology with moral partiality with no necessary conflict between the two. We can be objective in research methodology and normatively biased. For instance, to consider Israel a colonial settler project generative uh, of an apartheid system is an objective or scientific and it, it highlights uh, uh, the uh, policies anti-apartheid. By contrast, to depict Israel as a state that emerged from a national liberation movement carried out in an uninhabited land is an assessment that is methodologically, methodologically and factually unfounded, not to mention bias. There are countless examples of the sort that serve to variously depict Israel as a victim or a model democracy while overlooking its nature as an occupying power. The second consideration is the institutional gap that exists at the level of the larger Palestinian public and that necessitates ways to fill this gap with frameworks that bring together Palestinians wherever they reside. Of course, there have been other attempts to organize gatherings for the Palestinians, nor do we claim that research centers can fill the gap institutionally. However, they can contribute, for instance, by providing a regular meeting place for scholars to exchange ideas, not only by presenting research, but also by consulting on the hallways and straying or staying in contact throughout the year between rounds 
a process that can be even more fruitful if registration and attendance remain open to the extent that capacities permit not to, to all interested. It is no longer easy in the Arab world these days. The goal is to initiate a bridge-building process between Palestinians and between them and Arab and non-Arab researchers and activists that transcends social media in which both information and misinformation abound and facts are indistinguishable from tendentious uh, rumors in, addition, in, a, in order to foster rational orderly and responsible dialogue. The third and perhaps the most important consideration is the need for Palestinian and Arab scholars to coordinate efforts to counter the incessant attempts to insert Zionist ideas into the ways the way the general Arab public approaches the history of Palestine and the Palestinian struggle and to distort the values of liberation and anti-colonialism in the Arab culture. The process of inculcating such mindsets is accompanied by policies of normalizing relations with Israel and the absence of a just solution to the Palestinian cause. Indeed, part of the preparations needed to ensure the acceptance of these policies at the moral and cultural level involves projecting them onto historical narrative and distorting history that the Palestinian cause has been removed from primary and secondary education curricula in most Arab countries has facilitated the process. It has become easier than ever to distort awareness through the press and social media, especially given the unceasing Israeli activity in both. It's not stopping. This, what is meant here is not to correct the, the discourse by the Arab regimes before the 1967 defeat nor to negate the other or to monopolize victimhood at the expense of the suffering of others in the region. Rather, the purpose is to substantiate the Palestinian narrative with facts and prove the reality of the settler occupation and apartheid through national analysis, thereby anchoring and fortifying the moral position opposed to both. Researchers have the, a duty to respond to misrepresentation. To what, what we should say in Arabic, we should say in English, and in Hebrew if we can. We know that the heads of state in the Arab region and in Palestine will not read research papers presented here in such conferences, uh, and that these papers will not be influencing the decision making. But they are not designed to, nor is it the goal of the forum. At best, they will look at the matter as best to protect the interests of the state and through the lens of profit and loss that decision makers use to decide whether to adhere to or to renounce a given position. This is until now is about the background of holding this forum in collaboration with the Institute for Palestine Studies. Ladies and gentlemen, it took me a long time to decide what I wanted to say to you today. When I sat down to write my speech, it seemed to me that uh, this hesitation was the product of my determination to offer you something new in the nature of an academic lecture that claims to pose uh, timely questions, albeit without supplying answers. But this is not a research paper. Moreover, sometimes the challenge is not to say something new, but instead to reaffirm the ideas and principles we must continue to uphold. What I mean here is I'm not suggesting, of course, that we repeat political slogans as platitudes, even with the noble intent of fixing them in people's minds. Rather, I mean adhering to both stance and principle in the face of 
concerted attempts to eradicate them or uh, pretext of realism. There is nothing pragmatic about the status quo. And also the mentality that justifies silence on what is taking place in the occupied territories with the claim that uh, decline of the Palestinian cause on the Arab and international agenda has become the status quo. Uh, this is the situation now with the Palestinian cause which coincides with the 75th anniversary since the Nakba in 1948 when the majority of Palestinians were expelled from their homeland and the Jewish state was declared in the land of Palestine. And also by repetition, I'm not referring to the formulas which uh, heads of states uh, repeated in their statements. You remember that uh, at a certain time, this series of assertions were routinely reiterated after Arab summits and even at gatherings of Arab leaders in which Palestinians were not represented. Uh, this was the a refrain that required lip service uh, regardless of the actions after the prerequisites for realizing these principles were uh, obscured. Also for reasons which will take a long time to explain, the slogans started, <coughs> started only appearing through after meetings with Palestinian leaders, and even after this kind of gatherings, except for very few exceptions. On close examination, we find that the problem is not with the repetition of the chants, but with the fact that they have been rendered substanceless because of the absence of the will to do what must, must be done to implement them. It is not the repetition per se, but the context that have caused the formulas to become a threadbare cover for passivity. In fact, there is no one a singular Arab agenda in terms of regional and international relations. If there were such an agenda in hearts and minds, and not just in statements crafted to avoid getting into issues to which their authors are reluctant to commit, Palestine would be item number one. The question of Palestine has been sidelined because against the backdrop of the decline of the main Arab powers after the 1967 war, the series of crises that began with the invasion of Kuwait and continued after the invasion of Iraq and the decline of the Arab nationalist approach to Palestine, each Arab regime has its own regional agenda, even if it might temporarily uh, covered with the agendas of their regimes. So what is the point of repetition of positions have changed? There is no real benefit. Still, at the very least, suggest a need to cater to public opinion or the public mood, if you will. The end of this repetition would indicate that decision makers no longer felt the need for this consideration because their policies keep public opinion preoccupied with matters of greater importance to 
people's daily lives. This is not to say that public opinion has changed. We know from our research and many other manifestations, some of which you saw at the World Cup matches here in Qatar recently, that Arab public opinion on the Palestinian cause remains firm and unchanged, and that is Palestine is as much of a constant as Arab identity. On the other hand, when I speak of adherence to the stances and principles, my point is to emphasize the legitimacy of the Palestinian cause and the need for the struggle for justice for the Palestinian people to persist. I'm under no illusion that uh, this will happen by holding academic conferences and presenting research papers now published even in Western journals, the significance of which I discussed earlier. In recent years, we have seen an increase in the number of Arab regimes that have abandoned the Palestinian cause, not so much because they have spurned Palestine, but because they have developed corporate interest with the Israeli regimes. They were also attempting to establish a lobby in, in the United States to impact its Middle East policy and also to preserve security and stability in the region against matters relating to change and human rights. And also, they can. This is the real meaning of dealing with the Palestinian cause as a burden. They pay, if they pay a price for that, they do not consider it as a burden. But people who, people who talk about Palestine are the ones who have not taken part in the struggle or paid any price for it. These are the ones who talk about it as a burden. And uh, in fact, there are some regional powers provide pretext to provide support. This is a strategy which is well known. And also to emphasize the centrality of the Palestinian cause. This is important that somebody emphasizes the centrality of the Palestinian cause. But maybe they do that to delegitimize other issues. This kind of uh, uh, emphasis, I don't know how much it will be of benefit to Palestine. Also, to, we see it as the Palestinian cause being the last colonial case of occupation. And uh, it's the region is now being designed to take into consideration the needs of Israel. On the other hand, and despite the complaints from these regional issues and the need to ally with Israel, the very regimes uh, find their pretext in that to fulfill the resulting uh, people who complains with should not be should, 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 they should not be providing this pretext they left the vacuum themselves and the palestinian resistance needs the support and if the palestinian cause with its international and regional importance uh, uh, manifested itself in the two aspects. First of all, to abandon the national liberation movement since the 1990s, especially with the Second Intifada, and to engage in a peace process without any rules. And the, the result was between two parties engage in negotiations and also 
they consider the Palestinian struggle as an outside interfering element, uh, yet uh, the, the peace process is the only game the Palestinian Authority is sticking to right now. Uh, any strategy needs to take into account that there are socio-political structures in Palestine that cannot be overlooked. They are there and uh, we need to deal with them. I have spoken about this before in various contexts, but I reiterate my respect for, my respect for the futile, if courageous, attempts to escape this trap on the part of those who realized its nature too late. Oslo etc. Israel has for all intents and purposes nullified the remnants of the Oslo Accords with respect to territorial withdrawal and the negotiating the so-called financial status issues for a lasting solution. Should anyone remember these terms? It currently plans to annex Area C, restricting Palestinian self-governance to the densely populated areas A and B. This behavior was predictable as it has been ongoing since 1948 and is based on annexing the most land with the fewest residents. That Israel has disavowed even its interim commitments, sabotaged the entire negotiation process and intensified settlement expansion to an extent that undermines the physical foundations for a potential Palestinian state, including depriving it of its capital, has given the Palestinian Authority opportunity after opportunity to transition from a party to a futile, illusory negotiating process into an institutionalized entity responsible for administering a society under occupation or under blockade and subordinate to a higher committee that unifies the Palestinian people. <coughs> Clearly, the PLO must be rebuilt following a Palestinian national conference to give voice to new generations and unleash fresh capacities. After all, the PLO still enjoys international legitimacy and it remains the universally recognized legitimate representative of the Palestinian people. And uh, although uh, the authority talked about uh, this option, although the policies of uh, Israel at the level of the occupation and settlement and also the confrontation with the Palestinian Authority. I think that uh, all the Palestinian people hope that uh, the uh, latest announcement regarding the stopping of the coordination at the security level is the end. The second factor is the geopolitical rift between the Palestinian people and the territories occupied in 1967. This, in my view, is no less serious than the Oslo Accords themselves, even though it is a result thereof. In addition to its severely dire effects within the Palestinian context, its political impact in religional, uh, regional and international spaces of relevance to the Palestinian cause has been and remains destructive. Making matters worse is the short-sightedness of those who now devote the bulk of their energy to the struggle for power. A generation of Palestinians who were in the first decade of their lives when the schism occurred are now adults. They had never seen the PLO at its prime or the efficacy of its institutions. They grew up with two authorities, one in the West Bank and the other in Gaza, while Palestinians elsewhere follow the news from these two entities, individuals and groups from this generation are engaged in the struggle, making sacrifices. And even if uh, we uh, have uh, the borders of 1967 with its capital as Jerusalem and the right of return for refugees, they need a program, even though they are aware of the contradiction between the two-state solution and the right of return in practice. But what harm is there in the contradiction so long as the word remain a refrain, not an actual political project? <laughs> Meanwhile, Israel is reinforcing the occupation settlement, including Jerusalem, and Arab governments continue to pursue a new mode of gratuitous normalization with Israel, pretending that the Palestinian cause does not exist. 
Israel is inserted into regional issues and Arab conflicts, and some governments see relations with that state as an asset that is useful not only in Washington, but also in the context of Arab and regional conflicts. More importantly, they are all well aware that normalization has boosted Israel's arrogance and that the Israeli right has drawn two key deductions that reaffirmed the assumptions it crowds about in the Israeli media. One is that Arab governments are uninterested in the Palestinian cause and peace is possible without addressing it. Another is that if Israel persists long enough in imposing the statu quo, the Arabs will capitulate to the language of force and nothing will happen if Israel intensifies settlement expansion. This attitude is at the root of the extreme rights electoral successes in the time of normalization. This is uh, the uh, what we have seen when it comes to the success of the extreme right. There is a direct relation between the extreme right rise in Israel and normalization. The Palestinian leadership struggling to fend off the systemic Israeli drive to reduce them to hostages are incapable of fighting that or even making use of their people's sacrifices as the number of casualties and fatalities mounts in the struggle against the establishment of settlements and, and incursions into villages and cities or in defense of Al-Aqsa Mosque and the Arab character of Jerusalem. Although the authority is being subject to a conspiracy by the Israeli right now. At this juncture, we are also witnessing the results of a gradual shift in American public opinion, especially among the young, toward greater sensitivity to the moral dimension of the suffering of the Palestinian people under occupation and the immorality of the clearly discernible features of an apartheid regime. At the same time, the dynamics of the relationship between official Zionist ideology and the occupation is strengthening the Zionist religious right, facilitating its infiltration into the Hebrew state while uh, simultaneously arousing aversion among Israel's allies and Western liberal democracies. I will not dwell further on this topic, as I have already addressed the religious secular rift in Israel and the conflict between the Israeli populist right and the judiciary. I will simply note here the sharp escalation in this conflict and the likelihood that it will cause a rift within Jewish communities outside of Israel, especially in the U.S. Naturally, we need to bear in mind that to expect Israel to implode as a result of its internal contradictions is pure fantasy and wishful thinking. So people uh, say Israel is collapsing, but uh, this is wishful thinking uh, without real struggle and resisting Israel is not going to collapse. The continuous presence of the Palestinian people in Palestine and abroad, their preservation of their national identity and their limitless capacity for sacrifice in resisting the occupation and in the ongoing clashes with occupation forces in the West Bank, which is an intifada under new circumstances, combined with the solidarity of Arab public opinion with Palestine, the shifts in Western public opinion, and the relentless rise of religious Zionism among ever-broadening segments of Israeli society are all factors that ought to be exploited in the struggle against the occupation regime. However, this would require an inclusive Palestinian institution, one that formulates resistance strategies against that occupation regime. Failing that, it will be impossible to successfully take it on. Again, this cannot be done in the framework of the current Palestinian schism, which, as I have said, I hold just as responsible as the Oslo catastrophe. Nor can it be done in the framework of Palestinian authorities that organize their local, regional, and international priorities solely on the basis of considerations related to the scope of their authority. And this also applies to Gaza and their daily obligations to those living under their authority and not on the basis of a comprehensive national strategy. 
They cannot adopt a comprehensive national strategy, and this is the importance uh, or important dif distinction between ruling authorities under occupation or blockade versus an inclusive national liberation movement. Rebuilding the PLO can be a starting point, but not if it proceeds from a factional power sharing formula that immobilizes and it and reduces it to a mere umbrella organization. Instead, it should be built on national democratic foundations that take into account all factions. Furthermore, rebuilding the PLO cannot be a substitute for unity at the PA level. At the very best, least, there should be national unity government. So the rebuilding uh, uh, of the PLO should not uh, do away with the efforts to rebuild at the level of the national unity government. A battle as complicated as that of the Palestinian people cannot be waged without a comprehensive national strategy aimed at a unified goal. Solutions uh, to conflict uh, come through negotiation, but there are no negotiating frameworks capable of yielding viable solutions under the current power balances. What is talking about solutions now is futile. What is possible is sustaining that struggle on all fronts to attain justice. On the other hand, to continue to oppose negotiations and PA frameworks, whether in the West Bank or Gaza, for the sake of opposing them, only gives rein to a spiral of unchecked one-upmanship and the rhetorics and symbolism of the sacredness of the Palestinian cause. It also leads to the dismissal of struggles of other peoples as though they are competing for headlines, squabbling with other Arab peoples over who is the most oppressed and trading accusations of treason, anti-political and politician populism, and the monopoly of national action by grassroots initiatives, which are positive in and of themselves, but, as I have noted, risk becoming prey to a destructive dynamism in the absence of an inclusive framework. Inclusive framework. For a Palestinian national liberation movement with a responsible national strategy and inclusive democratic discourse. At times, some reduce the Palestinian cause to the scale of their daily aspirations and needs, or their local conflicts, keeping them from the higher plane from where they can view the broader picture of the liberating of the Palestinian people and the Arab region from the last colonial issue. Others magnify it to such an extent that it grows larger than the Palestinian and Arab peoples, and it is transformed into an idol which makes it easier to use against the Palestinian people and their interests and against Arab peoples. There is no doubt that the Palestinian cause is larger than either the West Bank, Gaza, the Arabs of 48th or the refugees. This is important to bear in mind, but it is not larger than the Palestinian people and it does not conflict with their daily concerns. It must fit a framework that represents the whole of the Palestinian people. On the other hand, its entanglement with the Arab question at the regional level, the use of the Palestinian question in the Arab context one moment and then abandoning it in the service of domestic agendas or foreign deeds, etc., and with the Jewish question at the global level, i.e. Israel's international representation of the Jewish question and monopolization of the role of victim, the Zionist lobbies, etc., makes it large enough to be hard to control and keep trained on the interests of the Palestinian people. This entanglement may only be transformed from weakness into strength through an organized Palestinian force active at both levels. Failing that, the struggle of the Palestinian people will remain prey to the complexities at both at the Arab level, where regional axes are forged at its expense, or in which the Palestinian cause is instrumentalized independently from the interests of the Palestinian and Arab people. 
and at the international level in the absence of a model capable of enlisting and benefiting from expressions of grassroots and official solidarity abroad. Without such a model, the Palestinian national cause will lose its standing, just as its humanitarian character is being obscured. Creating the space for such phenomena is cr as criminalizing the boycott of Israel and conflating anti-Zionism with anti-Semitism. So there are also other phenomena that we are supposed to face in light of the unified strategy. So this is where we start. I wish you a great success. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you. Our deepest thanks to Dr. Azm Bshara for this very valuable presentation. We come to the end of this session. I invite you to go to Salwa 1, Salwa 2, Salwa 3 halls. And I would like to remind you that we will come back this afternoon at 3.45. We come back to this all to attend the first workshop of this afternoon. Thank you.